All right, so we'll get started. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, panel discussion this evening on the Peace and Friendship Treaties, the Marshall Decision, and the self-regulated uh, Mi'kmaq fishery in Nova Scotia. Uh, my name is Trenton Augustine, and I'll be your MC for tonight. Uh, I'm the Indigenous Student Services Coordinator at STU. And uh, yeah, I'd like to welcome everyone. And uh, I wanna, we wanna begin by, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Wendy Matthews, our student counselor, where she'll be doing the introduction, so. Okay, thank you, Trenton. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce the three panelists. And I'm going to begin with the Honorable Graydon Nicholas. So uh, Graydon Nicholas is from Tobik First Nation and earned a Bachelor of Science from St. Thomas Uni St. Francis Xavier University. I'm a little biased. Uh, St. Francis <laughs> Xavier University, um, a Bachelor of Law from UMB and a Master's of Social Work from Wilfrid Laurier University. He was the first Indigenous person to receive a law degree in the region and the first appointed as a provincial court judge with former Supreme Court Justice Gerald B. V. La Forest. He had co authored the 1999 report on the Task Force on Aboriginal Issues. He served as New Brunswick's Lieutenant Governor from 2019 to 2014 and is currently the Chair in Native Studies at St. Thomas University. Welcome, Graydon. Um, our second panelist is Migmahan, uh, originally from Skanu Obadij. Uh, Migmahan's life work has been in cultural revival and community development. She is a member of the Mi'kmaq Nation and Wabanaki Confederacy and is a practitioner of Wabanaki spirituality and teacher of Mi'kmaq grandmother, long, long house traditions. She holds an uh, associate degree in liberal studies from the University of Maine and has extensive education and work experience in substance and behavior counseling, community wellness planning, group facilitating, and community development. She is elder in residence at St. Thomas University, where she provides support to Indigenous students. Welcome, Migmahan. And our third panelist is Dr. Pam Palmiter. Um, she is a Mi'kmaq a citizen and member of the Eel River Bar First Nation. She has been a practicing lawyer for 20 years and is currently an associate professor and the chair in Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University. She has earned a Bachelor of Arts from St. Thomas, a Bachelor of Law from UMB, and a Master's and Doctorate in Law um, from Dalhousie University. Her area of expertise is in Indigenous law, politics, and governance. She has numerous publications, including her book, Beyond Blood, Rethinking Indigenous Identity, um, as well as academic journal publications, magazine articles, and invited new news editorials. She is a well-known speaker, presenter, and educator on Indigenous issues in Canada and internationally, and is frequently called as an expert before parliamentary and United Nations committees deal committees dealing with laws and policies impacting Indigenous peoples. So um, everyone, our panelists. Thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, so we'll get right into it. Uh, at this time, we'll, we'll have, uh, we'll give the panelists a time to, to start off and to, to give a uh, each, each one will have, have a chance to give a speech. Um, and then after the, the each, each person speaks, we could have, a, we'll be having a question and answer period for around 30 minutes and uh, which will be moderated uh, by me. Um, and then following that, we'll have uh, concluding remarks by Dr. Kim Fenwick, the VP academic. So we'll get right into it. And uh, the first up, uh, we have on my list is the Honorable Graydon Nicholas. Um, so feel free to, to begin, Graydon. Thank you. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much and everyone. It's a pleasure for me and an honor to be with two other ex very distinguished panelists and women. 
Uh, I teach a course for a long time on treaty rights. So when a question was posed to me, could you explain treaties in 10 minutes? I said, well, it's usually a semester course, but okay, here we go. Uh, but actually what it is, it's um, the first case that dealt with treaties was this case called the Syllaboy case, which was a case in Cape Britain. And uh, he was eventually found guilty by the, uh, by the acting uh, county court judge. The county court judge did not recognize uh, that the 1752 treaty was valid. And secondly, he said there is no way that this particular individual could trace himself back to the treaty of 1752. Strangely enough, when the treaty of 1752 was signed in uh, Halifax, it was signed by the Grand Chief of the Mi'kmaq. And the defendant Silboy was the current Grand Chief of the Mi'kmaq at that time. So he was charged and convicted. And the two big challenges that First Nations people faced was number one, to prove that the treaties number one were valid and that they were validly executed. And secondly, is that you could in fact connect yourself to these treaties. And this was a major obstacle for those of us who were involved as litigants and lawyers defending our people in the, in the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s actually. Fortunately in New Brunswick, we were able to prove that the treaty of 1779, which the Mi'kmaq had signed in Nova Scotia at the time, as being a valid treaty in that it applied to the particular individual, Gregory Paul. And it was the first time that the Court of Appeal of New Brunswick actually uh, ruled in favor of treaty rights overruling provincial law. Now in Nova Scotia, the case of Simon, which was decided in 1985 by the Supreme Court of Canada, had a second chance to look at the treaty of 1752. And they ruled that the treaty was valid, that the parties that signed that treaty were actually at the capacity to do it, and that also there was a clause in that particular treaty, and I just want to quote part of it because that it says that it is agreed that the set tribe of Indians shall not be hindered from, but have free liberty to hunt and fish as usual. And of course, that was the essence of the case that Mr. Simon faced. And in the Supreme Court of Canada, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the earlier syllable decision was not valid, that it was very colonial in language, colonial in terms of uh, what, it, what it decided. And it indicated that the Treaty of 1752 is still valid. And not only that, that of course, uh, the uh, particular individual involved, Mr. Simon, uh, although he may not have had the capacity to genealogically connect himself to the 1752 Treaty, the Supreme Court of Canada said he is a registered Indian, he's a member of the Shubenaki Band, he's, he's, and that's sufficient for the Supreme Court of Canada. So everybody cheered when uh, that decision was rendered. And now we no longer had the obstacles of the validity of a treaty. And secondly, of course, the genealogy. Now, what brings us back then to the case uh, of what's going on in Nova Scotia now, of course, is the Marshall decision. And Marshall, Marshall of course, was fishing in Cape Breton. And then he was fishing eel, of course, for the purpose of feeding he and his wife. And uh, outside their season that was set up by the fisheries, federal fisheries. So he was convicted at lower level and upheld in the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal. But when he went to the Supreme Court of Canada, the Supreme Court of Canada looked at that treaty of 1760 and said that it's valid, that in fact, although the term that they would in fact, not only hunt and fish, but trade, may seem like a negative term, but he said it's positive. And it used different instruments of interpretation of law that the judges use. But in essence, the treaty of 1760 was valid. And secondly, of course, that he, ha he had the right to make a moderate living on some necessities. And it defined a little bit in the case what those were. And it also indicated, even though there was this right to fish and sell, the thing could be regulated by the federal government. But that decision was in 1999. And from 1999 to just even now, there has been no regulations that the federal government has strictly enacted for to regulate that fishery. So that in essence is what has happened with that treaty, that it's valid, but when you stop and think in the Maritimes, what we have are what we call treaties of peace and friendship. You know, the very first one was signed in 1725, and of all places, it was signed in Boston, in which uh, the Willistigawig, the Passamaquoddy's, Penobscots, and of course, later the Mi'kmaq all adhere to that particular treaty. And there have been a series of other treaties as well. The last one in New Brunswick was 1778, was signed at Fort Howe in St. John. The last one for the Mi'kmaq in, in this area, New Brunswick was 1779, which is what the Gregory Paul case did. 
So then this is what we are. Treaties, in fact, are defined by that court. And I just want to read a little bit of definition here of what a treaty is, because a lot of people will say, well, what is the definition of a treaty? And so I just want to give, and it's strangely enough, a case that was decided in British Columbia called the White and Bob case back, uh, back in the 60s. But it was reinforced by the decision in Simon. And this will be the last quote I give because I'm conscious of time. No matter questions you can raise after. But here's what the judge of the Justice Norris of the British Columbia Court of Appeal said. The question is, in my respectful opinion, to be resolved not by the application of rigid rules of construction without regard to the circumstances existing when the document was completed, nor by the tests of modern day draftsmanship in determining what the intention of Parliament was at the time of the enactment of Section 87, now 88 of the Indian Act. Parliament is to be taken to have had in mind the common understanding of the parties to the document at the time it was executed. In, in the section treaty is not a word of art, and in my respectful opinion, embraces all such engagements made by persons in authority as may be brought within the term, the word of the white man. The sanctity of which was at the time of the British exploration and settlement, the most important means of obtaining the goodwill and the cooperation of the native tribes and ensuring that the colonists would be protected from death and destruction on such assurance the Indians relied. And that definition, of course, has been approved by the Supreme Court of Canada as well in the Simon decision and other decisions as well. So when people ask what is a treaty, and basically if they say what he said, it's the word of the white man that has to be honored. The honor of the crown has to be uh, utmost in its relationships because it's got a fiduciary relationship with our people. So I'll stop there and transfer it over to the next panelist and I'm available for questions and answers later. Thank you very much. So I think that's me. So thank you, Graydon. And I got my timer on in front of me. So I'm calculating. Um, thank you. Uh, Tonight, and I want to thank the, uh, the people, the participants who have come here to uh, listen to uh, the panel. It's uh, it's very uh, sensitive um, for those of you who had um, seen the video last night. Um, uh, the first voice of that video you hear is, is mine. It's, pretty strong uh, accent. So, you know, um, I want to say that uh, in that video, uh, when we, in 1999, when we learned of the, the Supreme Court's decision on the, on the Marshall case, uh, it, for us, it was a long awaited truth to be acknowledged you know, in, in this country and in our homeland. And so uh, I remember the day when that was announced and what happened in my community. It, um, because the Sinaloa village at the time had a, uh, has, like most communities, have a high unemployment. And so when that uh, announcement was made, uh, it was uh, uh, an awakening, and it reminded me of something that I witnessed when I was uh, little, uh, how each fall, how people would uh, prepare to go and harvest, uh, um, to go work in Maine during the harvest. It was that kind of a similar excitement, but now it was just right out in the doorstep of our homes. Because the Sinaloa village, where it's located, it's as you've seen in the documentary, it's right on the waters. And so um, it was a big excitement, and the, um, um, the, how the community responded. Uh, for those in the, uh, in the community that had uh, traps, they immediately started to share with the ones that needed to go out and make income. Uh, that was short-lived, uh, as you all know. Um, and I think at that time, we, looking back, uh, that announcement 
uh, when that was made. Um, you know, it was not, um, we didn't think about some uh, that we needed to wait for anyone. It was an acknowledgement of, of our rights, our inherent rights and recognized through the treaty. And so those, um, uh, excitement was quickly halted by um, the disruption of uh, the, the enforcement. And so the first year I was not captured or recorded, but our community was severely assaulted um, by um, the loss that was uh, still not yet um, communicated down at the ground level. So the people at the ground level, as we're witnessing in Nova Scotia, it's not, there's some broken down of some system. So my community had to endure three years of um, um, severe violence, uh, assaults against uh, our community. And uh, in truth, I, it's still difficult. I didn't watch the video uh, last night because much of the people that was on that video are not with us anymore. And because of the, the trauma and the similar impacts that uh, that comes when people exercise their rights. And so um, we didn't have, uh, fortunately, casualties on the waterfront, but if you look at the video, um, I. There was, I'm just thinking who is still alive from that video would be maybe uh, the present uh, elected leadership, but most of the ones that was organizing and um, working with the community are, are, uh, did not survive the, the, the trauma going on. So, um, it's uh, still hard to talk about it. And um, so, uh, when our community uh, made that stand, it was not something that happened overnight because it, would be, it, it's, uh, it was a 10 year in the making uh, in our community when we were reforming ourselves and looking at our own traditional plan systems and uh, so we were, everything seemed to be in sync at the time uh, before the Marshall decision. And so, um, and we had had an election. And so the community had elected a new council that represented the plans in the community. And so that was uh, some, something was farming for us. And so when the new council was elected, they were really a strong voice for the community. And this is where Skinwall Village uh, did not um, readily sign with the agreements. And so, you know, with the agreement and that they were, uh, and they were quickly to develop our own fishing management plan. And so we were taking the initiative uh, because this, as I said, it was 10 year in discussions of uh, talking in our community and uh, looking at how we want to be as a community. So uh, it's the reality is, uh, as Graydon's talking about the treaties, uh, they're not uh, here at the ground level, you know, both for the enforce, uh, the federal and the provincial enforcements out there uh, are not kept. Um, educated or that's not in place. And we could have avoided so much, so much violence against uh, our community for exercising their traditional fishing rights, inherent rights. And um, we got to feel the heavy hand of Canada and uh, how uh, our elders were traumatized. And so on the video, um, the elder, including my mother, um, well, she's no longer with, with us. And uh, the elder Herman Somerville is not with us. And some of the, our natural leaders, 
who are a Herman and my mother. My mother's a plant mother in my community. Herman's partner, Eva, Summer is a plant mother. And so we, we, it was much more than just efficient that was uh, um, disrupted you know, uh, in our community. And so, uh, and, and we, um, this, what was a very, um, I don't know if I can find a word, but um, it was difficult to uh, look at what happened and uh, in reflecting back of uh, what happened and the depth of, um, of violations um, on our people uh, at that time. And um, it was, it was a real breakdown of uh, relationships, uh, even though those were always not very well with the Anglophone and the Francophone communities. And so like we got to see the, uh, the worst part of ourselves. And so uh, through fear, because of our own fears, uh, people were, um, mis we've been misrepresented for so many years, so many generations that uh, it did not help the kind of representation that was happening all around our community. And so the neighboring community was also um, uh, media uh, and the world media was there at right on top of our home. And uh, it's just um, understanding firsthand to really question the, that's where the title comes from because one of our um, uh, leaders, Clifford, uh, asked, uh, and he was a, uh, uh, a veteran, and he asked, uh, that's where the title comes from because he had inquired, is the crown at war with us? because we got to witness and we were victims of and, uh, heard, and experienced firsthand what happened. Um, and um, it's a lot, a lot uh, of stuff there. And so the, the signing of the agreement was not, um, unfortunately, uh, the direction of the community, um, but uh, what can one say when, um, when funding stops, you know, because that's what happened. You know, it's almost like the treaty effect again, at what cost and how was the treaties enforced? You know, so um, I think there's more story, there's so much more to say about uh, what happened in my community. And um, I wanna, I, really grateful for all of these for putting me in a good light because I was in the front lines the first two years, you know, when the media wasn't there. And it was it was not easy to um, um, to be grounded and, and to uh, when you're in that kind of uh, environment of hostility. So it's still very much racism and that fear-based um, mess of uh, institutions uh, and um, neighbors are still very much there. And I don't wanna dwell on that because I wanna focus on something um, um, to balance that out. I'm not a it, but I think we need to uh, do uh, much more work in educating the public. Uh, we keep repeating these stories every 10 years, every 20 years, like, you know, just this, this, this fear-based uh, system keeps bringing its head up and, and doing a lot of damage among our people. So um, thank you, everyone. I think I'll uh, and there, and I want to um, extend. Well, I'm really excited about having uh, Pam here. 
uh, and I know that uh, it's been a big excitement there among the students here when they learned that you're going to be joining the panel and with you, Lavia. Wow. Well, first of all, it's a really, it's a huge honor to be on this panel because I have long followed um, the Honorable Graydon's path. I took classes from him. He is one of the people who inspired me to go to law school. And of course, Migamahan, like, Everybody has been following you and learning from you. You are such an important matriarch. And it also probably doesn't help that I'm really missing home right now. <laughs> and I was wishing that I was in this Atlantic bubble, especially when everything was happening to our brothers and sisters in Sebaganegadi and uh, Butalageg and Eskasoni and all of um, you know those communities. So I, I really appreciate your words, Graydon, uh, you know, explaining to people in concise terms about the treaties, like even what is a treaty? I mean, people wouldn't think, but you get that question all the time. And then the development of the treaty law and of course, Migamahan, how it plays out on the ground because people don't realize the disconnect between a court saying, oh yes, of course you have the treaty right to fish, but then whether or not on the ground that actually works. Uh, you know, because we live in this whole colonial context. So I really appreciate both of your words. And, you know, all of this, we're having this conversation in a context of racism, violence, and dispossession and oppression. That's not new. I mean, this, it continues, it might continue in different forms, under different names, with different laws and enforcement. But um, you, this is the context in which we are having this conversation. And, you know, Mi'kmaq, Wolastukwe, and, and all of our nations have literally suffered genocidal laws, policies, and practices for, and for us, it's been centuries. You know, like if you, if the further west you go, it's less and less, but we, we've had the full brunt of it. I mean, I don't know how many times people understand when we're talking about treaties that imagine the crown entering into peace and friendship treaties, saying we're gonna protect one another. And then right after that, enacting scalping bounties, putting a price on the heads of men, women, and children to literally remove us because we refuse to surrender our land or our sovereignty. So even the treaties don't present the true reality. You know, you've got peace and friendship, which are great labels for it, but what about the scalping bounties? What about all of the things they did to make sure we couldn't actually benefit from those treaties? And I think that's why it's really important that when we're having this conversation that, um, you know, First Nations or our, our traditional nations are living, asserting and defending our sovereignty over all of our territories all the time and that the focus be on our sovereignty. And of course, I don't mean it in the European context or philosophy, you know, it, I mean it in the general sense of the concept, nationhood, peoplehood, self-determination, autonomy, freedom, like who we are as a people. Um, because, you know, we have to realize that we're also having these conversations in English and people will default to the English concept, the English law, but we have a very specific understanding and very specific concepts. And I think, you know, just in general, whatever word you choose to use, nationhood, sovereignty, autonomy, self-determination, that's only maintained through the people on, who are willing to take all of the risk and suffer the trauma on the front lines. And people don't understand the price that is paid for us to be able to enjoy our sovereignty for the people who suffer that trauma. And, and the families that suffer the trauma and the communities, it's, it's everlasting. The media might only be there for a week or two or a month, but after that, it's, it's ongoing. But yet our people will still step up and still go on the front lines and say, no, like the, we have jurisdiction and responsibilities and laws that govern our uh, land, sea and air territories. And we have an obligation to protect that. And nothing about the treaties has changed that. So some people say, oh, well, you signed treaties, so you gave up your lands. No, there's nothing in the treaties that say we gave up our lands and nothing in the treaties that said we specifically gave up our sovereignty either. 
And so I think that's an important point and not just one that we make, but the United Nations did a special study. You know, they traveled the world to look specifically look at treaties signed by European powers and other agreements with indigenous peoples. And they said it was very clear that when Europeans entered into these treaties with us, they did so with the specific legal acknowledgement that they were entering into agreements with sovereign entities and in so doing, not only confirmed our sovereignty, but it included all of the laws now that would govern that relationship between two sovereigns and not subject and, um, and um, that kind of thing. And, you know, how do I know this? Well, it's not just because the UN you know, study said this, we have never been subjects of the crown and nor have we ever been conquered because we heard a lot of that kind of noise that was going along, uh, people posting on Facebook, oh, well, you've been conquered. Um, well, how do we know we weren't? Well, first of all, all of our Mi'kmaq and Willis Dequay stories talk about, you know, our sovereignty and independence and, and not ceding any of that jurisdiction or our territories, but also that you know, our laws and our governing systems. And we also know um, the United Nations, you know, studied this intensively and made this, but also the Supreme Court of Canada, although it hasn't made um, decisions directly on the issue of sovereignty, even at the Supreme Court of Canada, there's a recognition of one, we were never conquered and two, we are sovereign peoples. I mean, if you look at the Haida Nation case at the Supreme Court of Canada in 2004, it said, and I'll quote, Put simply, Canada's Aboriginal peoples were here when Europeans came and were never conquered. I wish I could just mail that out to every media outlet and every social media commentator because, you know, that's the end of it, okay? We were never conquered. And we know that the law knows that. And then the second quote is really, treaties serve to reconcile pre-existing Aboriginal sovereignty with the assumption of crown sovereignty. And those two things are very different. You're talking about a legitimate lived time immemorial sovereignty and a new assumption of sovereignty. And now we are trying, we're busy trying to reconcile those things. Treaties in part are supposed to be somewhat of a reconciliation around that, but where that hasn't been reconciled, where there hasn't been an agreement, the, the, the real legitimate sovereignty rests with Indigenous peoples, and that's where we are as Mi'kmaq people. So when you think about who has the right, the clear right power and authority to regulate any fisheries in Mi'kmaq, um, that is with us. The Mi'kmaq people have the sovereign power, authority, and jurisdiction to fish, to trade in fish, to govern the fishery, to enact our own plans. And that's with or without the treaties. That's with or without Section 35 Aboriginal rights. And that's with or without government permission. So we need to have that conversation, you know, back it up. Treaties have only been in existence for a few hundred years. Time immemorial, we have our sovereign powers. All treaties did was recognize a part of what is part of our larger powers. And so treaties recognize some of these uh, issues, but they don't grant them. And so regardless of how the Supreme Court of Canada or any court, in fact, interprets our treaties is absolutely secondary to our sovereign power over our unceded, unsurrendered and unextinguished land, sea, and air territories. And that's where the government has to be pushed back. Because we have, you know, the other part of this is, <clears throat> it wouldn't be good enough if we just said, oh, well, let, you know, let's just let the government manage all of this and we'll just take what we can get because we would be abdicating our legal responsibilities as Mi'kmaq or Willis Sequoia people um, because we have an obligation. We don't just have an, an ability or a privilege or a right to fish. We have a corresponding obligation to protect the precious ecosystem in which the birds, plants, animals, and insects live and, and depend in order to survive. And so while there is a very, you know, capitalist commercial aspect to the way Canada has treated 
indigenous lands and bodies as you know, exploitable, expendable resources, um, and the whole basis of capitalism is on extraction, our system's a little bit different. I would argue a lot different. And there's never been any a doubt in any of the, you know, Mi'kmaq communities that are part of the larger nation that I've ever talked to that our laws and practices have to align with our responsibilities to all living things. And that includes the health and sustainability of the fisheries. I, literally, I've never even heard in the heat of the moment, someone say, it's our right to fish all those fish until they're all gone. Like never have I heard that even in anger. So I think it's, it's really important that when we're talking about self-regulation, that we have this discussion amongst ourselves first, you know, so within the Mi'kmaq Nation, amongst all of our communities, with our Wabanaki partners like the Willis de Quay, and make these decisions ourselves before we sit down at the table with government. Because the second you sit down at table with government, you're pushed on the reactive. It's like, here's how it's going to be, go and consult with your communities. And that and, and none of what they have to say should have any relevance. We decide, and then we go to the table and say, here's how it's going to be. You now go and consult with all your federal and provincial partners and come up with a solution. And I, th I think we need to take back control. That's not to say that, th that that's going to be easy. And I know that negotiation is always the preferred route. Supreme Court of Canada has said that. We have said that through the treaties. We have consistently showed up at endless, useless, insulting, demeaning meetings and gatherings and calls and letter writing. I mean, they just have us spinning our wheels, but we keep doing it because we are acting in good faith. We are extending our hand in treaty partnership over and over and over again because we believe in the treaty principle. I mean, we signed them peace and friendship for a reason. And so obviously negotiation is preferred. However, just because Canadian legal systems exist, just because Canadian forms of government exist, doesn't mean that we are now obligated to stand down until they decide whether or not they're going to grant us something. Because we know they're offside. They've been outlaws for a long time. They violate human rights, indigenous rights. They violate their own laws. So we can't trust them um, to act expediently or in our favor. And I think we need to uh, recognize that and, and start being a little bit more forceful. I guess the other uh, thing before I just end here is to say, you know, how proud I am and how much of an influence communities like, you know, Escanobidage and um, Sabaganagadi, Budalageg, um, Eskasoni, and, and all of them really all across our territories. Um, the um, Willis de Quay grandmothers who were defending their territories against the mine, all of them who take that risk, who, who we know uh, the consequences, and even within our own communities sometimes will be vilified or will be ostracized as, you know, making trouble or, you know, don't upset law enforcement, don't upset our neighbors, and that's colonization, right? But at the end of the day, in addition to forgiving ourselves for being colonized and understanding all of the different ways in which colonization has manifested traumas and difficult relationships, our sovereignty and this territory requires that we do it anyway, requires that we defend our territories. And thank goodness this time around, um, despite the racists on the ground in Nova Scotia, the vast majority of Canadians were on so on our side, scientists, biologists, lawyers, unions, teachers, First Nations organizations all across the country, First Nations, Native Americans were, you know, issuing statements of support. I mean, things have changed. And the reason why it's changed is because of us. It's not because the government has done any public education on our behalf. It's because we're the ones on the front lines. We're the ones educating. And we're the ones who are going to make a significant difference in this world. And if we have any hope of, in fact, saving the planet and all of the species on the planet, it's going to be Canadians standing with us, supporting our sovereignty and governing these territories in the ways they should have been governed this whole time. So I sorry I'm sorry if I spoke way too fast on that, but I was trying to race my clock.
Really great stuff. Uh, thank you very much, Pam, Graydon, Miga Mahan. Um, so at this time, we're gonna go into the question and answer um, part of our event tonight. Um, before I, we start with that, uh, I just wanna let everyone know how to use the Q&A uh, section. So you'll notice at the bottom there on the Zoom screen, it'll, it'll be a Q&A uh, box with two bubbles, chat bubbles. Um, and this is where you can submit your question. Um, and if, uh, Please indicate uh, in your question who the who it's for. So um, put their name, or or if it's for all panelists, put all panelists. Um, so we already have two questions. Um, we have the first one from Tiger Levi, um, and it's for the all panelists. And his question reads out: What parallels are you seeing now? in terms of the political gaslighting that the Canadian government has shown in relation to the current conflict in Nova Scotia. So that's that's for all panelists and feel free to, to answer um, whoever wants to go first. Also panelists can, uh, can see the question too. If you click the Q&A button, you can see the, and read the, the question. Um, so feel free to do that if you want to take an extra look at it. Um, I think I would yield to Pam first, you know, uh, because I think it was a great presentation. I can follow up a little bit later on about to expand on her um, remarks about the sovereignty and nationhood and uh, self-determination. Go ahead, Pam. Okay, um, in terms of, of gaslighting and government response, um, specifically in response to what happened with Sebega Negri, I, I, you know, I saw good and bad. The bad was the knee-jerk reaction by the Minister for Fisheries and Oceans um, was to make implications that this was an illegal fishery, that it was outside of conservation, it was outside of regulations, which all that did was fuel the fire that already existed on the ground. And it also, so it sent several messages. One, it basically sent a message to these racist and violent terrorists that they could keep doing what they're doing. It sent a message to the DFO enforcement officers that they could continue to not actually stop the non-native fishermen and that they could continue to like seize traps and things like that. Um, as, as the days went by and the blowback from Canadians and biologists and scientists was like really evident and there was large scale condemnation by Canadians, you saw a very quick shift. You saw all of a sudden a response from a Minister Bennett crown and did, I don't know, relationships or something, whatever, INAC 1 and INAC 2. Um, you saw a joint statement from her and the Minister of Fisheries Notions saying, oh, wait, 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 these are treaty rights and we need to uphold these treaty rights. And so I think that was a clear reaction from the Canadian blowback. Thank you, Canadians and all the supporters. And then you saw this this unprecedented press conference with four ministers. You know, you had the Minister of Public Safety, Bill Blair, you had the Minister INAC 1, Minister Miller, INAC 2, Carolyn Bennett, and DFO. And all of a sudden, literally on the same panel, you have Minister Bill Blair saying, oh yes, my RCMP officers, they did everything that they were supposed to, they're doing a good job. And then you have, you know, Minister of Indigenous Services Canada, Mark Miller saying, police have failed Indigenous peoples. And you just, you don't really see it roll out like that. And a huge condemnation coming from them, which largely echoed what Canadians were saying. So I see that as monumentally different from what happened during Escanobridge when we were following the media and just how our people were consistently portrayed as terrorists and violent and, you know, we need to stop them from fishing and, and basically really had nothing to say about the violence of the non-native fishers, even the stuff that we could see, um, or the violence coming from DFO or, or, or the RCMP. I mean, 
I think had that happened today, we'd see a very different response. So that's, I mean, how I see it, that's the good and the bad of how I've seen it so far. Uh, you want to go next, uh, Mikmahan, or do you want me to go? There we go. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, I think, first of all, I want to add on a little bit to what Pam, uh, I think, is teaching all of us. And uh, and I'm glad. I mean, she was a great student. I can tell you that. And anybody who teaches anybody and sees their particular student go beyond even what uh, may be covered in class, that's fantastic. But I wanted to remain also the public uh, of this idea of nationhood and treaties. Because it's only nations who can sign treaties, first of all. That's fundamental. And this decision, of course, by the... Uh, Chief Justice Marshall of the United States Supreme Court, it goes back to 1832. And I just want to read part of that because this is not this. I've used this particular uh, jurisprudence, if I can call that, to try to convince uh, judges in this country, to try to convince politicians in this country that we're dealing with nations. It's because it's only treaties that are signed by nations. Other than that, it's a contract. So here's what the Chief Justice said in, 19, in 1832. The Indian nations had always been considered as distinct independent political communities, retaining their original natural rights as undisputed possessors of the soil from time immemorial. And it goes on to say that the constitution, this is the American constitution then, by declaring treaties already made as well as those to be made to be the supreme law of the land has adopted and sanctioned the previous treaties with the Indian nations and consequently admits their rank among the powers who are capable of making treaties. The words treaty and nation are words of our own language, selected in our diplomatic and legislative proceedings by ourselves, having each a definite and well understood meaning. We have applied them to Indians as we have applied them to other nations of the earth. They are applied to all in the same sense. So this confirms what Pam explained about sovereignty, about how we exercise our rights as a, as a nation and as a community, as a tribe. And you know, the Royal Proclamation of 1763 even uses the word tribes or nations with whom we are connected. How are we connected with the crown? But by treaties, you see? And even so, I, I like what Pam said, but I thought I would reinforce that with this particular quote uh, that I always give to my class <laughs> when the discussion goes. But if you saw that video last night, I mean, how could anyone say that the fishery officers did not, did not commit criminal offenses in that video? How could anyone say that the RCMP who was supposed to be sent there did not in fact protect the people? In fact, the, their rights were violated. And so it's shocking you say 1999 has happened, but as Pam just said, here just, a, Two months ago, it's resurfing in Nova Scotia. And it's unfortunate, it's sad, this is still a reality in the Canadian consciousness. Many people, they just don't understand what, that we were here before. And we're still here. And that our people are nations. And that these treaties were entered on us also to say, okay, we'll enter into these treaties. And I think that's important for the academic community, most importantly, because we teach students. We can, in fact, give information to students who will go on and affect their particular communities and also help our own Indigenous students to understand that these rights are there. The Aboriginal rights existed long before any treaty was entered into. And the definition for me of Aboriginal rights is a way of life, simple. It's everything that we did. So I'll just stop there and hand it over to my good friend, Mick Mahan, and, uh, you can give us more words of wisdom. I just want to uh, quickly braid uh, on to what you were just sharing, Braden, and uh, but and again about the the breakdown of that communication. And you, uh, there's been a behavior and a set precedence for so many generations that uh, one of the examples that I want to give in the, what happened in our community in the village after all that was done in uh, our own uh, peace officers and war, uh, fishery um, um, uh, rangers were charged in the court system for obstruction of justice. 
And so even then, uh, the judge at the time honored the, our officers, but and uh, and he praised them, but he reminded everyone in the courtroom that with all due respect, you are in our courts, and you that I would have to enforce and charge the First Nation officers for obstruction of our justice. And then, you know, the breakdown of that uh, box or that thinking and why it's so important for people to know is that uh, um, if they would have further stepped maybe outside provincial level, or I'm not even sure on those levels, but um, that was a violation of their own. Canada's always violating their own laws. And so anyway, that's, I want to pass that over. I know there's more questions, but I just want to plug that in. So our people were charged, our police officers and our rangers were charged. And so how do we, uh, in the treaty, we have a right to our own justice system too. Okay, so our next question is from Kathy, and it's for all panelists. On university campuses, we'd like to talk, we like to talk about post-colonial this and post-colonial that, but looking at what is still going on in the world begs the question, what's post about coloniality? What could happen in law, in our communities, in our societies that would make you think, yes, this is a significant step away from colonialism? Oh, you're, you're muted, great, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll just go first a little bit because I, I know I want to hear from Pam too because of her experiences across the country. But uh, as everybody, as every Canadian knows now, the United Nations issued a declaration on the rights of indigenous people in 2007. Their major important functions, uh, articles, uh, 46 articles that are identified, identifies first of all, Indigenous people having what they call as individual as well as collective rights. And of course, for us as nations, we are a collective. And the thing is, in one of the articles, it says you have the right to self-determination. In other words, as a nation, as a people, we have a right to make our own laws. We have the right to handle our own economic and every other activity. That is now within this United Nations instrument. Secondly, is within that article, there's an article... 37, and I just read this out because I can't memorize it, but here's where it goes. Indigenous people, that's us, have the right to the recognition, observance, and enforcement of treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements concluded with states or their successors, and to have states honor and respect such treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements. So Canada is a successor of the Crown in Britain. So these treaties that we are talking about now were signed with the British, the Crown. So Canada's successor then has to honor these particular treaties that we have. And uh, it says nothing in this declaration in any way will diminish or eliminate the rights of Indigenous peoples contained in treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements. Unfortunately, we know that Canada has not fully endorsed this, this particular um, uh, instrument. Because they're saying, well, it's not a, it's not, it's only a declaration. It's not a covenant of some kind. Uh, but our treaties were covenants, actually, because they're considered by our people as sacred instruments. And so Canada now have to say, well, yeah, okay, we'll recognize part of this and we'll try to accommodate our legal uh, regime to make sure that uh, that we, in fact, will live up to our obligations. That is still what's being tested in our country. Whenever you deal with the development of uh, resources and the territory, they are traditionally ours, or in the exercise of what rightfully ours for hunting and fishing and trapping, not just to make a moderate living, but in fact to make a living, to sustain themselves. Why should our people say, you cannot become wealthy? Is it just the non-native who become wealthy with these resources? I mean, that, that itself is not a statement of fairness and justice, really. And so if Canada is going to fully endorse the United Nations Declarations on Right of Indigenous Peoples, as it has proposed in the current throne speech in Parliament, it has to go beyond just the statement of, okay, we like this. Well, it's not a matter of, that's not good enough. 
What's needed is in fact implementation of all the rights that are contained within that declaration so that we don't go into the government in a begging way. But that in fact is our dignity because we're nations. We are nations and we'll never stop being nations. And that's what the essence of our people are. So anyway, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree uh, with that. I think, you know, UNDRIP is raising a whole lot of questions right now, um, but there's some really important things to understand about UNDRIP. Um, it, it's not a granting document, it's a recognition document. So basically the way they explain it is that even though it is not a convention or a treaty that's been ratified, the rights that are recognized within UNDRIP represent what the United Nations considers to be already international customary law. So this is how they see um, the, the laws as it stands already. Because keep in mind, the vast majority of things that you find in UNDRIP, um, you can find in other conventions that Canada has ratified, for example. Um, or you can find... Um, in lots of in lots of different mechanisms at the UN level, and it also needs to be kept in mind that you know internationally speaking, any conflict, any case, any adjudication, UNDRIP is going to be the standard. So whether and how Canada chooses to implement it, that is still the standard that they're held to account. Um, and there's very important provisions in there. A recognition that all of the traditional lands that we occupied or used are ours and we get to manage and benefit from those lands, like all of our traditional lands. And there's another provision that says we cannot be forcibly removed from our lands. And these are like very significant in addition to self-determination, the right to determine who our citizens are, what the obligations of our citizens are, um, that all of these rights are equal to, to male and female people. But you know, one of the very first provisions is the importation of all of the human rights that exist at the international level and that we shouldn't have had to do that because we're human beings and so of course we have human rights but because they've been violated for so long it was they felt it was necessary to import all of the human rights and say oh and by the way all of the international human rights from the united nations human rights uh, convention they're also included within undrip and I, I, I like what um, the Honorable Graydon mentioned about the fact that none of the rights that are recognized within UNDRIP can abrogate or derogate or otherwise hurt um, Indigenous rights that already exist. And I think that's important. Now, here's a very problematic political reality. BC, the province of BC, was celebrated for being the first province within Canada to pass legislation that requires them to bring all of their laws into compliance with UNDRIP. I mean, that, that's significant. And no one was surprised by BC because BC um, tends to be more progressive in, in certain areas. But what happened with the first conflict of the Gidim Den and Unistoten clans defending their territories in Wet'suwet'en territories from coastal gasoline pipeline? There was a complete, complete ignorance of that bill that was passed, of their laws having to be in compliance with UNDRIP, and they sent in heavily armed RCMP and snipers to violently remove Wet'suwet'en peoples from their own territories, and in fact, their own places where they were living. So I know people sometimes advocate, we need more laws, we need more legal protections, but ultimately, if Canada just abided by the laws that exist here, Mi'kmaq laws and Wollastoquay laws and Canadian laws and international laws, we wouldn't have any of these problems because in case anyone didn't know, uh, racism is against the law in this country and so is genocide. So if Canada would just stop being an outlaw and abide by its own laws, you know, never mind our laws, we, we wouldn't even need to have this conversation. So we're really talking about a scenario of enforcement and assertion and protection of these laws versus the laws themselves um, and, and how they're being used. Because, man, even if they pass this legislation, if they act like BC did in the Wet'suwet'en case, we're not headed for a good place.
I mean, we signed treaties, that should be good. We have section 35, that was intended, supposed to be good. We have all these statements on the recognition of the inherent right to be self-governing and reconciliation and nation to nation relationships and laws that support all these things, yet we're in the exact same place. So we need to, we need to go beyond the law and actually look at the practical implications, the enforcement of it, the implementation of it at a political level and at a societal level. And thank goodness, I think society is a little further ahead than our governments are, and we just need them to keep pushing. Sorry if that was too long. No, that was great. Um, okay, so we have the next question. It's from Rebecca. She's a writer for the Quinian. And uh, her question is for all panelists. Why do you think this topic is important for students in particular to be educated on? So. Uh -oh. I don't know. Can we just go first a little bit? Now, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd sooner have Mikmahan say something at this stage, you know? Mikmahan, why don't you start us off? If you don't mind. I, I, I'm sure that uh, the question is probably some, somewhat answered by what's been shared by both you, Graydon, and Pam, uh, because uh, I would uh, begin to um, look at the question and uh, know the importance why uh, people need to be educated because to start to uh, build a, a better relationship and to inform students because students that are here at in post-secondary institutions are taking on the leadership. So I think it's really important that um, that they become informed that that and that. Uh, um, Lost, lost my train of thought, but I'm moving it forward to you and Pam. Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, you know, I've been teaching at St. Thomas University, believe it or not, since 1983 uh, in the areas of indigenous law, of history of legislation. And I did this uh, part-time, mind you, because I was working. And then, then even later on when I was a full-time uh, position there, and then when I got to be appointed as a provincial court judge in 1991, I asked the, uh, my chief judge if I could continue teaching in the, in the evening. Uh, Great Nichols didn't have night court like they do on TV. So anyway, so my classes were in the evening, a three hour time slot. Can you believe that on a Monday night? You know, six to nine out there, these students were sporty. But anyway, they came. And I did that till 1999. But in the cases I would have to teach, it could not be both New Brunswick because as a sitting judge, you, you don't deal with decisions you make or your, your other judges that make decisions in these areas. So I would have to confine my uh, explanation on legal cases, primarily from Ontario or out west. And, uh, but I would always talk about that, uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm sharing this evening. And also what I do now, because I'm back at school teaching since 2015 and, and still now, I always begin my courses by looking at the um, calls to action 94 and also the United Nations declarations of the right indigenous people. Because we look at these and I have the class actually read all this. So take turns reading these particular ones and then explaining the importance of each one of those things. So for example, like the, the notion of discovery, the notion of terra nullis, uh, how could they discover us when we were here? I mean, we couldn't face the fact that they, their compass indicated they went somewhere else rather than where they were supposed to go. It's not our fault. They were the ones ahead of us in science and technology, they told us. But the thing is, they did not respect who we were as a people. And it's contrary to even human rights law that existed since 1537. And uh, we had, an. so I talk about this, uh, of how, uh, Francesco de Vatuya came in our, as our defendant and convinced uh, convinced the Pope of the day that there should be a, a document signed uh, which would recognize indigenous rights and that the uh, colonials could not make us into slaves and could not take our land away. Mind you, the King of Spain, who was Catholic, didn't like that because he certainly didn't want the Pope to say that he was wrong. But that document is still very fundamental. 
And that basis was the basis of actually a relationship between nations. And that's still a valid document. And so I explained to the students that from the very beginning, we were nations, we were never conquered. And then somebody will say, well, great. And people were conquered. Here's what I tell them. The Japanese were conquered. Germany was conquered. France was conquered. Italy was conquered. Does that mean that they no longer exist as nations? Of course, the answer to that is no. And then they'll say, great. And why should these treaties that you talk about 250 some odd years old, why should they continue to be valid? I said, well, usually these are law students who ask me these questions. <laughs> I'll say, okay, what's the statute of Westminster? What's the date of that? 1066, we start tearing up trees. Why don't we carry up that document? And of course, that's the basis of law, right? In European law. So if you begin to say you want to destroy things without fulfilling what you in fact sign, then what are you saying to yourself as a nation? And the more that our students know what these factors are, when they go back and be teachers, be professors, be whatever field of profession that they're in, they will interact, or maybe they'll even be policymakers or politicians, or heaven forbid, be judges. But the thing is, they need this knowledge, probably because that's the first time they've ever heard of this. Maybe at law school, they never studied these courses, but now it's being a bit more prominent. And as uh, so this is what's important. We have to make sure. Uh, my always, uh, my motto is, um, with education, there's liberation. That's pure and simple. The more you know, the better as an individual, you can interact with others without being threatened of your own identity and of your own source. So I'll take my professor hat off now and say, I've said enough. I'll turn that over to Pam. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's an important question. Uh, you know, wh why is this an important issue for students to know? Because first and foremost, this is real life. These are, are the, the lives, the traumas, the deaths of indigenous peoples. And that's significant. So this isn't philosophy, this isn't politics, this isn't, you know, you know, studying something for another purpose. This is life and death. And students need to understand it that way. This isn't about rhetoric that, you know, this we're either going to live or die by ongoing racism, violence, and dispossession, and they need to understand it. Um, and I agree, you know, with the Honorable Graydon, education is so important. It's liberation, but it's, it's also empowerment, right? If you, if you take education the right way, so you can take education to tick a box to get a degree, you can take education to tick a box for diversity at your place of employment, you can take education for entertainment purposes. But that would be a real insult to the purpose of education, because the purpose of education is not only for empowerment, but it is to inspire action action for change, action for good. And I don't think anyone can argue, no matter what political stripe you are, that, you know, everybody wants good. We may define it in little bit of a little different ways, but everyone has the right to life and well-being and safety and security. And, and so education and what we're doing here isn't just for people to know more. That, that would be horrible. It's to do more. And what education does is it doesn't just identify a problem. You know, like, oh, look at all of the, you know, murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. It's like, well, what's the root of the problem? What's the cause of it? How did it start? What's the contributing factors? And then how do you address it? But then if you just left it there at the recommendation or solution level, we are still where we are because there's that unfinished factor of action. Now, what do you do to organize, strategize, and put that into action to take concrete steps? And that's where every government has fallen down. It's like, okay, we know what the root of the problem is. We know what the solutions are. End of story. And then we move on to the next report, which does the exact same thing. And we need to put this into action. And that's what these panels are about. It's like, we just don't want you to sit here and say, oh, isn't that too bad about the treaties? No, like you have an obligation, a moral and a legal obligation to take action on it when you know more. And we're not saying you have to be on the front lines, but you have to do something. You have to use whatever skill or influence or power or wealth you have to put into social justice because you can't expect social justice for yourself if 
everybody doesn't have social justice because there's literally no such thing as incremental equality. Like you either have it or you don't. There's no such thing as incremental rights or a little bit at a time. You either have it or you don't. And it's up to us to decide what do we stand for? And if Canada is going to go around bragging that it stands for human rights, well, it better stop breaching all of its human rights laws. And it's the job of Canadians, the real governing body, to force these spokespeople to do their job or hold them to account. Because that's the difference here. You know, we're talking about action, but consequences and accountability. There, no longer will we as Indigenous peoples or Canadians stand for violence and racism and the trauma that's inflicted on Indigenous peoples. And yes, some of that's going to mean a transfer of power, wealth, land, and um, all of that back to Indigenous peoples. It's going to be a recognition that we deserve um, our place on Turtle Island, because keeping in mind that we are the original sovereign nations in this territory. And so long as there is one land defender left, we always will be. And it's in Can you know, Canadians and indeed the world's best interest to get behind Indigenous peoples, because you don't see a whole lot of other people putting their lives on the line to, to protect the lands and waters from complete and utter climate destruction. And that's where we all need to come together. So next, we have a question from uh, Anonymous. It's for, uh, for Pam. Uh, what role impact does the media have on this issue? How do they frame the dispute in Nova Scotia, for example? Does the media cover the issues differently in different parts of the country? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, the role of the media has been by default the primary public educator about Indigenous issues. And, by, and I say by default because all levels of government should have long been engaged in public education on Indigenous issues and not just in K-12 to or post-secondary because we have multiple generations of people that are long out of school, will never go to post-secondary. How are we reaching the public? And there, because there isn't any public education campaign, the media de facto serves this role about education. Um, on the good side, I will say that they've improved in the last 10 or 15 years. There's more Indigenous voices, there's more Indigenous perspective, there's more Indigenous context and background. But in many cases, it's still quite problematic. Just the fact that this whole situation in Mi'kma'ki was being presented as a dispute or that there is two sides. I'm sorry, there's never two sides to terrorism. Like never, the violence, racism, property destruction, uh, intimidation, all of that came from non-native fishers. All of that was to secure their economic power and wealth within the fisheries. And all of that was meant to intimidate Mi'kmaq people from not exercising their rights and to intimidate all the local stores and fish buyers and sellers from helping Mi'kmaq people be able to enjoy their treaty rights, despite the fact that it's constitutionally protected under their own laws. And so all of the media that presented it like a dispute, like two sides, you can see how that then was replicated with the RCMP saying, oh, well, you know, there's two perspectives and we understand there's passions on both sides. Well, since when is terrorism a passion that you would actually go and get a mediator and bring the terrorists to the table with the victims and say, you know, let's understand your passions a little bit better. So I don't fault the media entirely because if they see that roll out, you know, the federal government has, in appointing a mediator, normalized the violence and terrorism against Mi'kmaq people as a passion, as a side. And so how does the media understand and report that unless they have a really good context? And so with the good and bad of it all, literally on the same channel, and I'm not going to pick any, you know, at the six o'clock hour, they're saying, oh, this is terrorism by these non-native fishers. But at the seven o'clock hour, they're reporting it as a dispute. So there's a lot of inconsistency. I see a lot of struggling to represent us properly, but I also see a lot of improvement in large part because of social media and indigenous peoples have taken to podcasts, videos, blogs, writing, and, and getting our own voices out there. And some media coming to say, well, what's really going on here or us advising the media behind the scenes. So 
there's good and bad, but um, the problem with the media is, is that if they present it like a passion, like potentially lethal violence as a passion, as a side, and you normalize that as okay, someone's going to lose their life. And, and that's like, that's not, not acceptable. So the media has to really understand they need to be consistent all the time or they're risking people's lives. And that's how serious it is. It's well beyond politics or rhetoric. Okay, so we have uh, a question from Monica. Um, she says, um, Dr. Palmiter's point regarding the continuous non-involvement of the government makes me ask the question, has the language of the Canadian government, media and education changed to any significant degree or not really? So Mika Mahan and Graydon, you can go first, because <laughs> I just ranted. Well, it's been a while since I've been involved with government, you know, back in the 70s and 80s when I was more active with the Union of New Brunswick Indians uh, as lawyer, everything, I think, policy advisor, going to court, and then being involved with government. But, you know, when I brought up this notion earlier about nationhood, I remember in, in the late 19, about 77 or 78, one or the other, uh, at the time, the National Indian Brotherhood, uh, now it's some of the First Nations, asked Indigenous lawyers, and there were just a handful of us back then, to be involved in uh, cabinet uh, Indigenous uh, discussions. I happened to be put into justice portfolio, and Mark Lalong, who was the Minister of Justice at the time under the Trudeau government, uh, there were at least, I remember Wilton Little Child and Lyra Little Bear and myself going to the meeting at the uh, Department of Justice in Ottawa. It goes to show you a little bit about Indigenous humor with this stuff. As we were walking on the streets, getting ready to go there, uh, Leroy says, hey guys, why don't we go get a bite to eat before we met with the uh, minister? So we said, where are we going to eat? He said, oh, there's a sign right there. Let's go eat. Look, shepherd's pie. Shepherd's pie. This, I like that. He said, and I said, why? He said, well, if we eat shepherd's pie, they won't, they won't be able to pull the wool over our eyes. So <laughs> that kind of sense, it, there's always an indigenous sense of humor to all these things. So when we entered into the hollow building of the justice building, which is right next door to Supreme Court of Canada, on top of that building is this facade of, uh, I'm not sure if it's some, uh, it's a Huron or maybe somebody from the Haudenosaunee Nation. Anyway, we go in there and uh, as we making our introduction, Leroy says, oh, by the way, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, I just, I just, I'm so glad that your department is saying that Indians are above the law. And so Mark Locke says, well, what do you mean by that? He says, well, look at this beautiful character you got on top the doors of the Department of Justice. And, and so, and needless to say, Mark Long didn't enjoy that sense of humor. But then when he got down to talking about substance and I said, Mr. Minister, I said, uh, Indians are sovereign people. He said, that's a non-starter because he was dealing with the FLQ and the separatists in Quebec at the time as a minister. And I said, well, that might be a non-topic for you, but for us, it always has been. We're sovereign and we're nations. And I quoted that decision from the Supreme Court of the United States, which he had never heard of. And he kind of looked around to his uh, advisors there as if, is this guy making up law as, as he usually does or what's he doing here? And I said, no, it's there. It's, it's, this case is important because it deals with the relationship uh, of indigenous uh, nations as well as the, the crown and the successors of that as well. He didn't like that at all. I can tell you, he tried to shut me off, but the more he tried to shut me off, I said, look, uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer of that. And, our, and, and I said, uh, maybe the mistake that was made with me is they taught me how to read. And I can read this stuff. And now well, I, I got an opportunity here to advance an interest of indigenous people and I will, whether you like it or not. And so I think the, you know, we're talking about, wasn't it Trudeau who said, uh, Aboriginal rights are historical might have been? We're talking about when the white paper policy was written by him in secret to try to take away our rights and make us into citizens of provinces. 
And here was a highly educated man uh, from, from Quebec studying, uh, you know, the, the code of law in Quebec, but very, all these people were intellectuals in terms of law, but they were never taught what we are talking about here tonight. And until that changes and the government accepts that, you know, I'm involved with a committee nationally, which is trying to convince the federal government to come up with this covenant of reconciliation. That is a major part of the, of the calls to actions. And you know, they're dragging their feet on this. They appointed an interim committee and the interim board released a report in 2018 as to what this thing should look like. There's been no movement on legislation by the federal government on that. Because what's important about that particular council is they will be the ones who will monitor if in fact the other, other calls to action are in fact been fulfilled. You know, it's been five years, it's been sitting there with very little action. And now when Pam talks about also the calls to justice, which is this other report that uh, concerning our women, again, that is falling on deaf ears. So when and how will the government ever fulfill uh, its words? So that's, that's what I say, I don't, I don't know. I don't think there is the moral fiber in government leaders to do anything, I really don't, because their vision is, look, we've got another election coming up in four years, we've got to appease our supporters. That's been my view of it. I better stop there. <laughs> I, I just wanna add uh, my thoughts about uh, the language has it changed in the government or in the media? And um, uh, I don't have much experience for sure on uh, either, uh, but I do, one thing I do uh, understand is the relationship. We still have a long way to go. And so um, just in our area and uh, being here in Moose to Kuwait uh, homeland, um, you know, there's a need to begin to recognize our, our own traditional form of governance. And uh, that's, that's all under uh, recognized in the treaties. Uh, so when, when we're working in improving relations uh, with indigenous people in the, uh, Canada or the um, provinces, I think we need to begin to, and the work that's happening in the ac academic community in decolonizing our languages and restoring, you know, uh, our own traditional systems, like rematriation in Wabinaki, what does that mean? You know, I'm, this is the, the what, I don't like to use the second wave now, you know, uh, because of what the lockdown and where we're at, but this is the next, deeper level of building relations because we are a matriarchal uh, uh, culture. Uh, and we, what does that mean? Uh, and the role of women, you know, and uh, I've been looking uh, to uh, reconnect with uh, Pam because of your presentation with the work in the missing murdered indigenous women and girls. Uh, that's a very deep seated, um, uh, reality of being in the misogynistic world. And so when we're talking about language and um, um, building relations, we need, we need to, you need to experience our longhouses. You need to experience our, um, uh, who we are as a people. And the, the, the sad reality here is that we are longhouse people and we are homeless in our own homeland because we don't see longhouses and what the significance of those uh, structures are. There are governing traditional governance systems. So I get, I just want to put that forward uh, when we're talking about language and uh, because there's so much more that we can offer in uh, for the future, especially in these times. 
think those are all really important points because often when we just even say the word language, the natural default is, oh, it's French or it's English, but not not thinking about how you know the revitalization of our languages um, or or the concepts um, in regards to the question around you know whether the wording has changed in government um, sure uh, it tends to go back and forth if you look at the trends you know each level of federal government kind of takes turns being the bad guy you know, so during the constitutional talks, Pierre Elliott Trudeau was the very bad guy and rude and disrespectful to Native people. And then all of a sudden, Brian Mulroney comes in and he wants to be best friends, you know, the Conservative Party. So, you know, you've got the bad Liberal Party, the good um, Conservative Party. Uh, and But now they've totally switched roles. I mean, under the former Harper Conservative governments, uh, you literally had the Minister of Indian Affairs standing in Parliament calling Native people, Native leaders, specifically the treaty chiefs as threats to national security. So just, just think of that one sentence and what message that sends to all of society, which you know are largely don't have the background or the education on indigenous issues or know much about us and say we're threats to national security. Again, justifying the disdain, the neglect, the racism, the violence, the denial of our rights, human rights and, and native rights. Um, so that's significant. And that was bringing us to a, a very dangerous place. One of the reasons why Idle No More came out under the, uh, the Harper government because of these words, because of uh, these actions. And then you switch to the Trudeau government. And I will give the Trudeau liberals credit for changing the rhetoric because rhetoric Although it's empty in a sense, it does, it's a form of education, it's a form of messaging to the public. So now the Trudeau Liberals come in and say, there's no relationship more important than the one with Indigenous peoples. We have to respect them on a nation to nation basis. And it's going to be, our nation to nation relationship is going to be based on respect for Aboriginal and treaty rights and, you know, all of that stuff. So those are important messages to get out to society especially for those who don't hear anything but the political rhetoric, who only tune into the news at 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. or, you know, read the newspaper. Um, th that's very limited education to have. So rhetoric matters in that sense because bad rhetoric is like um, inciting hatred and violence and good rhetoric could help undo some of that damage and make people say, well, hmm, maybe I should look further. But you've got to go beyond rhetoric. Rhetoric doesn't change anything. So look at where we are on every socioeconomic indicator. We have gotten worse, right? And I'm not saying that's because the liberal government's worse. I'm saying because they're doing the exact same thing that the conservatives did. They just add some dressing to it and some funding to it so that it looks better. But suicide rates are worse, foster care rates are worse, murder to missing's worse, incarceration is exploding beyond anything we could ever have imagined. I mean, youth corrections, some of them are 92 and 98% Indigenous kids. I mean, what do you do when you get to 100%? Like, what do you do when it's th that the only people in prisons and youth corrections and foster care homes are Indigenous? That says something about you know the crisis that we're in when we don't take action. And so I think going forward, what we need to tell people is, okay, words are important, yes. Symbolism is important, yes. Celebrate National Indigenous Peoples Day all you want. However, you need to take concrete and substantive actions on the life and death issues, whether it's from the Truth and Reconciliation Report, the National Inquiry Report, RCAP, the Manitoba Aboriginal Justice Inquiry, Ipperwash Inquiry, Marshall Inquiry, it doesn't matter. But we've got to do something to address these multiple overlapping crises that are killing our people. And there's no nice way to say that. And so we've got to we've got to put actions behind those words. And I don't have faith that the government will do it, but I have every faith that Canadians will push, that they will use their numbers, their power and their influence to do that because we've seen them do that. We've seen what their support can do in terms of changing the narrative around, which changed very quickly in Mi'kma'ki when at first the governments were like, oh, you know, maybe they're not following conservation. And then just this massive support from Canadians is like, okay, okay, wait, yeah, no, it's not, they're not breaching conservation. I mean, we couldn't have done that by ourselves. We need that kind of support. And that's what the treaty 
relationship is all about. And I think that's what we need to be educating students about, that they have an obligation to make sure that our lives are protected just like we protect theirs when we stand on the front lines to protect Mother Earth from complete and utter destruction. So the final uh, question I've got here, and it, it's kind of good because it's a, it wraps everything up and uh, a good concluding question. Um, so it's from Anonymous and it says, uh, uh, it's for all the panelists and it, they're wondering how are things going to go in Nova Scotia um, now and, and in the future, so. Feel free to, to answer. Graydon and Ming Mahan. Yeah, I think from my perspective, I think although I'm observing from a distance, but I think that um, there's no doubt that the leadership of the Mi'kmaq people are going to continue to exercise their right. And uh, it's not just in Nova Scotia, because we're hearing that in Newfoundland, we're hearing that in Prince Edward Island, and we're hearing that also on the Eastern coast of New Brunswick. And they're relying on the fact of this 1999 decision, which recognized that they have a right. And uh, a right that's different than what the other users of the resource are, like I'm talking about commercial fishermen. And so the federal government has fallen asleep on a switch. They just have not sat down with indigenous leadership to try to say, okay, how do we come up with you working together with us uh, for you to be able to uh, do what you wanna do? And I think that is uh, how long that'll take and who is going to do it. It's gotta be done. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and the sooner it's done, the better. Uh, after all, our people uh, welcomed the Im initial immigrants who came here. Uh, as I told the group the other day, all, the, our, all our people had to do was turn their back and they would have starved to death. They didn't know what food to eat. They didn't know where the good water was. They didn't know how to take care of themselves at the time of sickness. But that's not our people. We're caring people. We're loving people. We respect others as well. And I think that's the message that I think should prevail over everything that our people want to be involved. We want to be involved as equal and as partners, not, okay, here's what you have, this meager little thing for basic necessities. It's more than that. It's more than that. And the dignity of our people demands that, I think. And I think, I hope it happens. And like Pam says, if the public is not threatened by what our rights are and who we are, they will support, but they will support as long as they understand the struggle that we've faced, the struggle we're still in, and hopefully the change that'll take place. So I'll stop there. Uh, you know, um, I first uh, have mixed thoughts, mixed message, mixed thoughts about that. I, it's. I'm hoping, like everyone, that things go uh, uh, turn to a positive. Um, and I get worried about um, any uh, any uh, any agreements uh, in working with uh, my uh, if that's economic economy or economic related. Um, I, even though I don't feel good about uh, it's a very um, disturbing um, the term in the in these agreements, uh, life, uh, moderate livelihood. Um, I feel like um, my concerns are really about uh, how it's going to move forward. You know, I think we need to. And I know Pam, you mentioned it uh, several times about how do we uh, not just, it's not just an indigenous 
uh, responsibility, but it's all our responsibility to protect the natural sources of life that sustains us all. How do we safeguard the natural world? Uh, because of our, if we don't, you know, it's going to impact us all. Like so, uh, what the recent developments here uh, is concerned both indigenous and non-indigenous about localizing, you know, and how we sustain local businesses and all. And so how, I'm just, I'm just open, like, you know, for discussion like that, but that's my, uh, where I'm at in relations to thinking about all that. I'm, I'm excited and happy about the acknowledgements and um, the support that has developed. Uh, but I'm concerned about how economy is uh, being uh, handled and at what point will we uh, begin to look at an indigenous model, how we manage, maybe follow a model that uh, our people, you know, uh, our philosophy is founded on. So pass it along to them. Thank you. I agree with both of those comments. And um, before I respond to the question, I, I have to acknowledge that in all of this, um, it doesn't go without saying the level of risk that individuals, families and communities take, the level of trauma that they have suffered and do suffer when these things arise and the everlast the, the, the long lasting impacts. So like Eskinovidage, you know, when all the cameras go away, people have to live with that. And same way, that's going to be the same in Sebag and Agati. Like, it's going to be the same there. And so I think it's important to acknowledge the trauma of these situations. From a governance perspective, um, from a nationhood perspective, from a sovereignty perspective, everything has changed and there is no going back. And I see that as a real strength that comes out of the difficulty, the trauma and the challenge that not just in Mi'kma'ki, not just in Nova Scotia, but it's going to be in PEI, it's going to be in New Brunswick, it's going to be in Newfoundland and it's, and it's going to be across the, all of Turtle Island. And we see that happening. We see what happens when the Wet'suwet'en defend themselves and act in solidarity and call, you know, inspire the rest of us um, to defend our lands and waters. And we're, we're inspired by that and what they did. And, and people are being inspired by what, what's happening in Mi'kma'ki because despite all of the violence and terrorism and, and intimidation and property destruction, we didn't respond in kind. We responded as treaty people uh, because we don't want to fight with our neighbors, right? We don't, we're just trying to enjoy our rights. And so I think you know, what's going on here. There's a lot of things that people don't know that's happening behind the scenes and that's necessarily, you know, confidential for strategic purposes, but everything's changed. Nothing is going back to the way it was. And every time we go through something, we just get stronger and stronger. And so the next time it'll be even stronger. And and because there's always going to be next times. And, and that's what I take from it. The, um, just the strength, the amount of preparation that went into this, like this wasn't just one day people said, hey, we're going to go fishing and not follow conservation rules. This, they've had a governance plan in place for a long time that like, there's been a lot of work put in place in this. And so I, I consider that a positive and, um, and, and I think that's infectious. And that is going to continue to spread in communities across the country. And we work in solidarity because the very first people that reached out were other First Nations. I mean, imagine, here's the Haudenosaunee at 1492 Land Back Lane getting shot at with rubber bullets by the OPP um, and being violently arrested. And when they make their media statements, they first acknowledge what's happening in Mi'kma'ki and stand in solidarity with us and ask people to fundraise and send donations over there while they're literally in the middle of their own land-based struggle. And the Wet'suwet'en did the same thing and the Shekwepmik did the same thing. And it's so, you know, we're all coming together as sovereign nations. And I, and I think this is really 
this is a shift. Everything's changing and it's, and it's all going to be for the good. And, you know, I, I think Canadians uh, jumping on board are, is going to be a real good thing for Canadians too. All right. Well, I deeply appreciate everybody, um, the panelists today, Pam, Megamahan, Graydon, uh, very great discussion, very great insight on this, uh, this situation. And uh, I know personally, I've learned so much tonight and I'm just very thankful to have the opportunity to, to moderate this uh, panel discussion. And I also wanna thank the audience for, for joining us tonight uh, for these great questions and great discussion. So uh, finally, I want to hand it off to uh, Dr. Kim Fenwick, our VP academic at St. Thomas University for concluding remarks. Um, so Kim, you have the floor. Thanks. Thank you so much, Trenton. On behalf of St. Thomas University and the Senate Committee on Reconciliation, I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you to our panelists for giving of your time to speak to these very challenging issues and for inspiring our, our lively conversation. And thank you to the audience members for, for such great, great questions. At Stu, we are trying to respond to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call that universities lead the rebuilding of the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. We have a significant number of Indigenous students at St. Thomas, as well as Indigenous faculty members, a chair in Native Studies held by the Honorable Graydon Nicholas, the Mi'kmaq Maliseet Bachelor of Social Work Program, Native Studies Program, Indigenous Language Programs at both St. Mary's and Tobik First Nations, uh, we offer university courses to students at St. Mary's and Elsie Bucktuck First Nations. And we have the Wabanaki Resource Center on campus. And soon we are very excited that we will uh, be welcoming a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Studies. We are trying to advance reconciliation through education, dialogue, and cultural events. And as we've heard tonight, and, and we all agree, education and dialogue are invaluable for the future. And I might add that having such respected commentators as the Honorable Grady Nicholas, Meg Mahan, and Dr. Pam Palmeter, who is a STU alumna, is important for our, our students, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. So again, thank you all. Um, please stay in touch with each other and stay in touch with us at STU. Good evening. Thanks everyone. Have a great evening. <laughs>